Thank you very much, Priya. And um, it's, yeah, it's really lovely to be here and amazing to see so many people and quite a few names there I recognise. So um, hello to you all. Um, I wanted to really kind of introduce some of the themes that are sort of the background of why I thought it was worth writing a book like this, particularly at the moment, and dive into a, a flavour of some of the things that I think um, many of us will face um, as challenges in the organisations that we work with and then sort of move on to a bit of a discussion and hopefully a conversation about um, sharing ideas about how we can um, sort of move through, help our organisations be better positioned to make better services by default, um, at least where possible. Um, and it would be great. I know many of you will have like enormously good experiences of this all as well. So um, I will spend perhaps sort of 15, 20 minutes um, talking, showing examples, um, sharing some ideas, and then it would be wonderful to have more of a two-way, multi-way conversation with us all. Um, so Priya gave a lovely introduction. So I think the only thing I would mention is um, my background. Um, so sort of over the space of about 20 years, I've worked in the service industry, so telecoms, um, internet service providers and technology companies, as well as more in the public um, sector over sort of the last 10 years or so particularly. But my background is an unusual one um, in that um, I actually um, spent much time um, in operationally running services. So um, being responsible for standing up entire new services, digital ways of, for example, registering for a telecom provider, online billing and so on. Um, thinking about how many people we might need in a contact center to be able to support customers before um, really focusing on user centered design, human centered design, and then looking at leadership in particular and the ways in which we get in the way of better services, um, all the ways that we can support it. So I come with that kind of background and why I think, or maybe some of us are all here today is that we, we recognize that the larger, older organizations weren't made to deliver services in the um, era we find ourselves in at the moment where there is quite a lot of technology change where um, people are familiar with um, interacting with services in quite different ways, where there's a lot of change and not necessarily our processes are designed to keep up with, even at a sort of layer of protecting our organisations from difficult security challenges, let alone designing things that work really well for people. Um, and I think over the last sort of 10 years in particular, um, we've done phenomenally well, like all over the world, in developing really good ways of designing new digital products or services involving users, starting with what people actually need, what works, what doesn't, and then testing and learning our way to do that. And we've got amazing processes, standards and so on to help us do that. Uh, however, the rest of our organisations and how things work, and particularly where influence comes from for new pieces of work and change, hasn't necessarily changed in the same ways or, or not in keeping. Um, and so I think there's more to do to create the conditions where everybody in an organisation can deliver better services. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and just to give a few examples of that, like not that we're, I'm sure like none of us are kind of unfamiliar with um, a sort of human centred design process. But um, this is a social enterprise um, called Peak Vision um, and they develop um, tools to carry out professional eye examinations on handheld devices. And they do that so that they can work in countries with more rural populations where people can't easily go to an eye clinic or to a hospital. And it's really to prevent avoidable blindness of which the majority of blindness in the world is potentially avoidable. So um, they uh, developed a product that does an eye test and in the development of it, they had to set sort of operational criteria things like the distance you needed to be away from the patient to conduct the test and the lighting conditions. So you need good contrast for people to be able to see things on a phone. So it generally needed to be performed indoors. And they said, um, and this year it was like a three meter distance from people and indoors, that will give an accurate test. They told the devices so that the devices could tell at least for contrast whether those conditions were being met. Um, and they 
the people doing the test kept coming back um, with the um, data that the, the criteria weren't being met, so the test results were invalid. And the team couldn't figure out why because the instructions were so clear. They sent the team, the sort of development team, design team out with the field workers and they went door to door asking people to do these eye, eye tests. And they realised that very few people had three metre space in their houses. So the field test was left with a difficult choice of do I do it outside and ruin the contrast or do it, do it inside and not keep to the right distance? And until they saw it for themselves, they couldn't have quite imagined that because they were there, they were able to change those criteria overnight, test, make sure that they'd um, had the same efficacy and were then able to conduct that. Where you have one really high performing team that can do that sort of stuff, that is great. That is what kind of this process was designed for. In organisations where you have dozens or hundreds of teams doing this, everyone's working at different levels, different pieces it's really hard to consistently follow this process at scale, or at least this process doesn't quite give the answers for how you might do that. And yet the, the ways we do have to, to design and do things by scale, so for example, um, with very complicated projects like defining requirements quite clearly, making sure you've kind of closed down any loops so that everyone knows what's happening in ahead of time, and then undertaking work and then hopefully delivering a solution, a product, a, in this case, a website. But those processes were never designed to be able to learn, test and iterate quickly. And it's really easy to look at a headline like this and kind of think someone's to blame. But actually, it's probably the process itself of very complicated requirements up front. It makes it very hard to deliver the thing in totality. One way would be to break down something so that you can then deliver something more quickly, but that process wasn't designed to do to work in that way. And one more example, and this is an older one now, but the um, healthcare.gov, so the health insurance marketplace in the USA. And originally, um, it when it was when it launched, um, it couldn't support the volume of people. There were huge wait times even to use the website, um, and it. It sort of it was uh, sort of widely well known the, the problems that it faced, and again um, there's no sense in trying to blame anyone. But how organisations buy technology and procure technology was never designed to be able to learn what's needed, test what's actually going to work before operating at this kind of scale. And in this case, it took an enormous amount of money to fix and remedy it. And it's these kind of problems we want to avoid, but. Those are just a few examples. Um, the research by the Standard Group sort of suggests that it's a pretty widespread problem. And some survey they did um, within a particular country was found that sort of fewer than 20% of these large government IT involved projects are successful. And of course, we're not just talking about technology. Technology underpins how successful our policies are, how successful our services are. So it's all part and parcel of the same thing, really. Um, and I think this will be sort of familiar to many of you. I just wanted to add in a bit of like connecting up all the bits of an organization. So if um, you know what's what users get to see and um, the particular designs we present them where we want people to be able to do something is all well and good. Um, and we can do some really good design. But if we are somewhat limited in the choice of what is being used, whether that's a PDF, somebody in person, use of AI, like all of that can affect how well something works for somebody in a particular situation. But sometimes we don't distinguish between the two things there. And then underpinning those is, of course, the way in which the organisation has sort of structured its technology, its data and other infrastructure. But more than that, it's also kind of generally behaviours and working practices and processes within the organisation as well, and even relationships. And and to some extent sort of power dynamics as well like all of this goes into how well something works for somebody overall or how well it delivers policy intent but then going deeper than that it's also as we've seen in examples it's how procurement set up it's um, overall incentives given to an organization it's how much attention and time leadership have to actually get close to be able to properly scrutinize or help direct work or make decisions at the sort of quick sort of rapidness and urgency that might be needed. And then, you know, we're all thinking about sort of policy intent or maybe some of just decisions about what happens. 
that then sort of filters through the reality of how large organizations are sort of structured in these ways and then whether what actually meets the user can sort of can work or whether you actually achieve the policy intent or you know there are enough things to kind of get in the way or filter what we're actually trying to get done um, and I think that's why we talk about having to change some of how these organizations work or at very least get much clearer about the impact they have as we're trying to make better services and policy and I've been on my own journey around understanding the different ways in which policy is carried out. Um, and I'm still um, on that journey, as I think some of us are. I think my focus um, without, you know, there are a lot of different ways and tools and mechanisms that we, we have. Um, my interest in particularly for the larger operational type of organisations is with sort of services that are created for users, potentially around commissioning and procuring work. And then some forms of legislation and regulation and potential initiatives and interventions there as well. But just to say, cognizant that there's so many ways in which policy is carried out and some of it is more directly influential to services and some of it is a more of a sort of influencing from the side. Um, so this, those parts in particular are what I'm thinking about when I think about policy in terms of services. Um, so to help organisations design and deliver better services in the future, I think we have to look at how changing how they are working today for some of those reasons and complexity um, that we just spoke about. Um, and this will be really familiar to many of you um, and particularly sort of heralded by, you know, Lou Down and the original service design um, team in the uh, government digital service in the UK. Um, but sort of a service helps someone to do something and I would sort of add, you know, where an organisation has a particular outcome to achieve. And it's not always directed entirely by the user, like some services are sort of done to people or happen to people. Um, but you can still apply many of the same principles about how well it works for people, how fairly people are treated within a service. And there's a few examples there, but what's really interesting is how many organisations are defining what they do in terms of services for people in this way. And here's an example from the British Red Cross uh, many central government departments in the UK also have either published published versions of their list of services or are working on them internally. And it's a way of framing the remit of an organisation and potentially the scope of policy in terms of how it would make sense to somebody externally. Um, and why that becomes interesting is when you think about the notion of performance and so one way of thinking about performance is how well a service might meet the needs of people. Can people find it, use it? Does it deliver the outcome they're looking for? But there's, on behalf of the organisation, there's how well everything involved in delivering it works, how well it's working for staff, um, how well the technology that's underpinning it can flex and change according to what the service needs to do. And then from a policy perspective, what the overall outcome and results are. So rather than for thinking about a service purely in terms of policy outcomes, purely in terms of user needs, purely in terms of tech cost of running technology, it's a more kind of holistic approach to thinking about how well a service is doing what it should do, including its overall job. Um, and I don't know about um, you all, but certainly my experience like these days, it's pretty common for organisations, not just in the public sector, actually, but in the private sector, thinking about banks and telecoms firms and so on, to be talking quite squarely about the services they provide, how well they work for customers. They might have like large customer experience teams really focused on it. But if you start to interrogate, if you really know what their services are in terms of how, how they really make sense to one of their external customers or how well they work or all of the work that's already in play, the things that are changing, how that those changes might impact that overall service performance and then um, <laughs> there's a picture of an office there which uh it's, you know it's a fairly familiar site in certain quarters and certain places um and i think what's useful about thinking in terms of you know the structure of a kind of end-to-end -end, um mechanism like a service is that unless the policy intent changes unless the service fundamentally starts doing something different that kind of in abstract the structure of it doesn't change that often but everything about how it gets delivered can if there's a new policy coming in there's a 
change to an operational mandate or in the case of peak vision, a change to the criteria. So if you can make a statement about what good looks like and say something either in terms of numbers or words about how you'd know if you saw it, it can give you the basis to then look at different policy decisions, look at different levels of evidence coming in and think about what might be better ways to get to what we actually need to do here. And um, there's an example here about, you know, thinking about performance in terms of effectiveness. Does the service do what it's needed? Like services have a job, are they doing them well enough? And at what cost? Be that to the organization, be that to users. And it's the sort of model that's fairly widely applicable, not all services, but many of them. Um, and sort of grounding it in kind of reality. So who's actually doing this or, or, or learning about doing this or, and why? Um, so the passport office is, is one example. Um, and this is Colin talking about how, um, although they have always been sort of fairly focused on customers and getting people passports, um, how um, uh, policy had one view of it, but not necessarily the same as from the customer's perspective. Um, the case management team had a very different view and then they had agile delivery teams, but they weren't necessarily aware of how the bit of work that they were doing related to the whole end to end passport service, which encompasses suppliers, logistics and so on. So they created an overall view of a service and they particularly put in what decisions they were making at each stage and on what basis those decisions were being made. And that provided a really useful tool, not just for the operational teams, but also um, some of the decision making in terms of policy and strategy who could think about some of the impact about changes they might want to make at a given point. And it gave a useful tool so people could now see, OK, these teams are involved or these suppliers in these stages. This is what the service is actually trying to do. This is the information you're trying to get from it. And this is when we can tell it's not working well because we see these things happen. And it gives a much sort of stronger and closer to reality basis to make some of those decisions. Um, I've talked quite a lot about, you know, some examples of where it goes wrong and some sort of aspects of thinking about in services and um, in services like how how like tools that we can use to think about how well services are performing. Um, one sort of the third and sort of last part I wanted to touch on is about how organisations are structured and how they might operate. And I sometimes have conversations with people who sort of talk talking about, well, you know, is, is sort of orienting around services, is that an ideal or a target operating model that we might aim for? And I feel a bit hesitant because it's not it's not an operating model being service led that you could pick up and apply to any organization and suddenly, you know, for the first time in decades, that organization will operate completely seamlessly from now on. The world is not that simple. But if you put service performance in more of a driving seat or at least being considered when you're making other changes, it does start to have some implications for how organizations operate and the design of different teams. Um, and I'll just give a few examples of that. So one might be in um, sort of how work moves through an organization. So in the policy design space, I mean, this is squarely where, where we're working. Um, and I suppose one principle all the way along in this is it's 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 not it's not right to think of it as a linear left to right process but it's messier than that kind of how work moves to an organization but being mindful about avoiding um solutions being overdeveloped at too early a stage deliberately including gaps in the documentation or the slide decks or the conversations we're having with people that are pushing for work whether that's a minister, whether that's a policy person, whether that's a service owner or somebody else. Um, not just for the sake of it, obviously, but because we want to be able to identify which elements or which type of problems need to be explored more by a multidisciplinary team or need a specific way to learn, test or iterate that like we cannot predict how this will work. And that generally tends to be when things are more involving behaviour by real people in the real world. So we might be able to do some exploration about sensible pricing strategies, for example. It's much riskier to um, think about how people might be able to interact with this option or that option or um, be able to use this tool or that tool. That needs um, sort of testing and working in reality alongside the actual people that might be using it. 
so this it's definitely got implications for how far we go and the sort of process involved in looking at how work moves through an organization if you think about services and teams that work on services i think you can start getting to a sort of shift towards having more services where the services are big enough like where they're important enough like some services are very small very transactional they're not they're not as sort of they're not such a front runner for their organization but if you think about sort of org design more services and teams set up around them doing things to them operating them changing them and a lot of cross cutting infrastructure to support that you might then have fewer functions or not as many or not as large functions and one off projects so there's a sort of shift towards this in some places and a shift away from this it doesn't mean that these functions don't necessarily exist but it's just where might it make sense to focus on the service which might cut across these things than it does to try and um, influence work shape work dictate work often in conflict from different areas of the organization because that's slow it's expensive way of operating and how it that you know as some examples of what that might mean for teams you might have in some cases more solid permanent teams working on a service and you already do to an extent they're often the operational teams but i don't think it makes so much sense to have that distinction between business as usual operations and then change teams since the two need to work together but instead of having one or the other or generic digital teams that always have the same makeup no matter what they're working on it might be helpful to consider where you have teams changing in quite a meaningful way a part of a service which should definitely include the people who run it the staff that operate it you might have people doing day-to-day -day operating but why wouldn't you want the skill sets to be able to make changes as you go but sometimes you also need people to focus on something really complicated whether that's a novel piece of policy a fundamental change to doing something differently um, you might want to do some investigation into sort of the use of AI in particular areas that could be incredibly risky you might want to stand up a team to focus just on that but this model is quite different to currently how things are often structured particularly in the UK government where you might have the idea of yeah, policy teams doing some upfront work, including sort of good policy design. But then at some point, a sort of implementation team takes over. But that's and then at some point they might hand over to an operational team. So it starts to paint a different perspective on that. Um, and I was just interested by the uh, um, some of the work on um, mapping um, infrastructure for London. And by that, I mean the real, you know, plumbing and lighting and so on. And this is work to kind of uh, consider um, uses of data to make you know a city operate but in better ways but I began to think like here is an example where people can be citizens can be disrupted by roadworks and so on you've got a lot of different organizations a lot of different intentions going on about lighting air quality water piping sewerage and so on and here is an attempt to kind of bring people together seeing where a lot of the infrastructure lies when is likely to be developed and what might be a solution to it that will result in the best outcome or the least disruption and it's just an example of you know in terms of whole services or outcomes for users a lot of different work is impacted so what might be ways in which we can work across organizations to think about how something could perform better overall and um, just a few other examples um, uh, around how an organization could change to support better services and I'll give an example from the um, vaccination service in the NHS. And this was particularly around the COVID vaccinations during the pandemic. Um, and some of you might be fam really familiar with this work, not least because of having a vaccination, but potentially having worked on the service as well. Um, and James is talking here about how decision making changed. So rather than you know, having um, an initial initial um, steer from the um, government or from uh, ministers, it wasn't good enough because they needed to get as many people vaccinated as possible within a tight time frame. They couldn't wait for the next board meeting, the next committee meeting, the next point in the diary of somebody important to make a decision. So they had to have teams able to go straight to decision makers on a daily basis with specific questions, trade offs to make and decisions to keep the whole thing on track. And the 
idea that if a decision couldn't be made, that the team could go ahead anyway. And they had the full support of uh, clinicians who were very focused on needing to maximise the number of vaccinations done. And that really was quite different to how decision making tended to work in the development of a service, which would be much sort of slower. And I think it's probably on us to make the consequences really clear of when we're not getting the decisions we need in the time we make, because often teams just sort of carry on and try and do the best anyway, without it being apparent the kind of the cost, the delay, the lack of quality going on because of how governance structures tend to work. Um, and then just finally, sort of stepping back and thinking about organisation structure in, in total. And it was really interesting um, talking to British Telecom and particularly their consumer digital team, um, whose uh, chief digital innovation officer was um, it's been quite heavily pushing the idea of rolling out the idea of organising and structuring teams and operations around customer goals, services and outcomes with and thinking about performance quite cohesively and then looking at um, interesting improvements they could make to across the whole estate by which they mean sort of the underlying technology data and so on that got in the way of services that previously because they'd been organised around individual functions it was very hard to prioritise pretty cross-cutting work because the sort of the budget holders wouldn't have seen the benefit directly but the whole organisation the whole service would as a result so that's been really interesting from not just from the customer's perspective but also the sort of organisational benefits to thinking about things more as a whole um, I'm going to stop there and just really, if nothing else, just I think it's so important that we think about making better services means making better service organisations. And there are lots of different ways to do that. And I think we're all learning different ways and sharing them. But it would be wonderful to hear a little bit from people, perhaps in the audience. Um, I don't think there have been questions just about what do we all think of this? What have been our experiences? What are some of the challenges we're facing about it all? And I will stop there and hand over to Priya, Katerina. Yeah, so uh, let's open up the floor. Anyone has questions, uh, feel free to. It was quite quiet now. So uh, yeah, raise your hand, uh, Martin, go for it. <laughs> Cool. Long time no see. Great, great. Uh, thank you so much for this. Um, I have one specific question. We've been trying to like map services in various countries, and one thing we even heard that certain government departments were even against doing that because it would slice kind of like things in a different way, and people who have a certain logic in their organization today would be kind of like even scared of having a different way of looking at things today because that might um, threaten their power and shift things. So what are what are approaches that you have seen working well to kind of like take a um, service lens by, for example, like listing, first of all, what servers are there and how to bring these people who are really um, holding on to kind of like their view of the world and to kind of like bring bring them along, because that seems to be a really big challenge. Mm, yeah, really good question. It sort of gets at the sort of <clears throat> slightly unspoken, but really important point that thinking about an organisation in this way directly challenges power dynamics, particularly where you've got, um, you know, the main board or different lines, like the, the very highest levels of leadership organised instead around the different um, functions. It's a very difficult job for somebody working on a service to then effectively call into question the entire structure of the leadership. Um, so it's really interesting, isn't it? And, I keep hitting on this um, sort of underlying belief or sense that people hold that an organisation is there to serve their job, their power structure, their team, rather than them being there to serve the remit of the organisation. And we're all get like, you know, not everyone wants to risk their job or change their job. Like, you know, there are there are nuances there, but it's a real kind of shift and an interesting and uncomfortable shift in perspective. So I'm basically adding like support for how important and relevant a question that is. Um, I think things that you can do. Um, so firstly, acknowledging that and being really clear about it and not being that surprised when some people are really not keen to, to, to sort of take it on board. I think there's also a sort of 
you can sort of unwittingly scare people off if you say like here's a new way to think about everything um it's got real implications oh my god you're potentially you're going to lose your jobs or change everything about the organization by thinking in these ways so you can sort of people can take it to the sort of mean or job is at risk if I don't recognize my own role my own operation in here and I've certainly been involved in an organization in the um, private sector who's it was very interesting how people were sort of shoehorning in sort of the the lighting of the office as a service lest if they didn't feel that they were there they they thought that that would run the risk that they would lose their job so um I think we can oh yeah unwittingly paint a picture so a forever saying like these are just services these are just a way to look at it the other thing is it probably isn't super helpful in some cases unless you've got some really important big services and a lot of change going on so sometimes it's a sort of rather starting with the structure as a conversation it feels like you could take some of the same implications and think about you know we've got all this stuff happening and you know you can't really tell if it's all doing the right thing or not there's probably a way that we could look at this that would help tell us by the way that's an important service by the way we've got some other services but maybe we don't focus on those now um but I think to your point, yeah, let's be aware this is really challenging purposefully some of how these organisations are set up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Uh, Stuart, do you want to go? Um, thanks, Katrina. Um, Thank you, Kate. Uh, got a great presentation. And I just wanted to maybe echo the point that Martin was raising there, but from the different end of the telescope. Um, at Basdon Council, we're we're uh, we're great believers in a bit of double diamond, and um, and we love and we love all of our diagnostic and design work and engaging people all the way through. Even with that, sometimes we find that whilst the technology might stand up after a few iterations and the work processes can be really clear, the behavioural change and sustaining that behavioural change after the project starts to close is where we struggle um, and uh, colleagues revert back to behaviours which have been learned and ingrained over many years and that we're rocking up and saying, hey, try this great new way of, of delivering something. Um, and mm. I, I'm just interested in your reflections from your experience, Kate, about sustaining behavioural change, please. Mm. Yeah, and you've hit on like, yeah, the, the reality of doing this and why it isn't as simple as like oh yeah here's some principles for changing the organization let's just apply those isn't it because it's probably one of like the the things that take the longest and and also if you can change it people are less likely to kind of go back again but as a result it just takes a really long time um i think um just having a sense of the reality of time scales involved for fundamental behaviours to change and people to kind of operate quite differently, whether that's at a leadership level, an operational level or anything else level. Um, and I think some of what makes it difficult to have one off projects and programmes is because the change doesn't happen in that time frame. Like you say, you can change design processes, things like that. Behaviour might take years to change. And it's really hard, isn't it? Cause you've got definitely seen examples where people in a position to kind of work alongside and sort of coaching pairing up role to be able to make it a little bit more sustainable um there's um particularly um around sort of developing different approaches to service leadership and, you know there are like sort of three characteristics of people but most people that I would come across would only have sort of two of the three that you're looking for um, and it's really hard to affect change otherwise, but pairing people up together. So one person with the perspective of how this can work differently, one person with the knowledge that actually makes it real of how to affect operational change, but doesn't necessarily have the same behavior and working alongside each other in some way for a longer period of time than that one of change has been one way of, of affecting that. But let's be realistic, that has implications of a cost and availability of time and so on. So it's probably not realistic. In, every single place that we have it but where there's something really important together then that's really interesting and I think in other places sort of in, in big services they've created um, different roles within the sort of the day-to-day -day operational roles and created entirely new career paths where you have people either providing sort of translation layer between the change that's going on in an ongoing way and then making responsible for every all of their colleagues to be aware of the implications for the job or how we do things and so on on, on an ongoing basis um 
or you kind of make people um, entire like as a sort of um, entirely responsible for gathering feedback from the operational colleagues and working closely with the change that's going on. So you start to blur boundaries between things and not everybody wants to do that sort of job. Some people are quite happy with the way that they are at the moment, but identifying the people that are more prone to thinking, being curious, wanting to relook at things and then finding sort of capacity for them to do that in and amongst the one-off projects is perhaps one other way. But yeah, good, good, very real question. Thank you. Uh, should we take a couple of more? Uh, Erika, I think you are next. Okay, so, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it and I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on the situation I'm in at the moment. So for context, I'm a project manager at Westminster City Council and I'm working on the North Paddington programme. So it's a new way of doing things. It's a space, there's going to be a lot of community engagement. And as a result of that, I'm really keen to bring in the service design principles and user research. So I'm currently finding myself straddling between the lines of you know, scoping projects and also designing new services. And so it's that idea that there's two sets of languages that I'm sort of having to grapple with. Mm. You know, this idea that you're either a project manager or a service designer, but I see myself more as a blend. And I think it can be quite easy in the public sector to be really defined by your job title and where you sit within a particular department. Mm. And I have this idea that to make a better service organisation, that really should be, things should be a, a lot more fluid. So what are your thoughts on sort of not defining ourselves by our job titles and becoming a bit more collaborative in our ways of working? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. And um, I think that's really interesting. And I think there's sort of, um, there's one really, um, really clear benefit and value to having clearly defined roles, which is particularly when you're trying to bring in things that haven't exactly worked in the same way before for one thing in an organization and sort of different skill sets and practical experiences from elsewhere it makes sense that you recognize that as a role that you're bringing in professional skill sets and so on however just by bringing in specific roles and professions does not magically make all services good and make a great service organization and so i think coming at it from the other way um, the most important thing for fundamentally changing how things work is less about a specific role it doesn't sit in a particular domain but I would say about um, traits like understanding enough about how to navigate an organization and how things work um, uh, being open-minded and curious and being conscious enough about modern ways of doing things implications of and risks of technology um, possibilities and design user research or under open-mindedness um, and then collaboration and skills and wanting to do that and instinctively seeing the whole so I think where you have and perhaps there's a bias towards some professions having that more or people with that um with those characters being drawn to one profession over another maybe but I think that's much more important than job roles so if you can find people with those three characteristics across any role and perhaps you're one of them then I think that sets you really well up no matter what position you're being. So, yeah, as a way of trying to identify other people in the organisation, that those are sort of the three things that I would look out for more than, you know, is it OK that I do this job even though I'm not a service designer? Or is it OK that I'm naturally thinking in those ways when that seems to fall into that profession? Like, yes, it is. Not to say you can't benefit from other people around you, but, yeah, those three traits, I think, are really, really powerful. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your answer. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a Kate <laughs> with a question. Um, Kate, Hello. Hello, other Kate. Nice to see you. Hello, Kate. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, this is an also another role based question. So I'm, mm. I'm at the OU, the new head of service design at the OU, but we also have a new role at the OU which is um, that of service ownership and actually our service owner, who's the first service owner, um, is on the call. Um, and you talked a bit about how 
you don't just move wholesale to a service-led model um, and that's kind of what we're in the process of figuring out is like how do we move incrementally towards that service-led model but if we've got this role of service owner we're sort of trialing out I'm interested in your thoughts on like what are the sort of key things that that role should be thinking about or doing in the environment where we're not yet in a model of service led and we have like service owners who do sort of neatly own these things in the way that the organization is structured yeah yeah really great question um uh, i was in fact i was just having a conversation this morning about this very thing and we were talking about the um because in one sense it sounds like a nice idea like you've got this idea of an end-to-end service wouldn't it be nice if there was someone that knew about it and could guide work across it like that sounds like a great idea brilliant okay but the person comes in they're like uh okay like the whole organization isn't, doesn't know what I'm doing or why I'd be here or I'm so now overlapping with other things and so on so um yeah it's not straightforward but that said there are gaps without having that that ideally you're trying to address and those gaps will be felt as pain and cost for the organization without it so one of them is particularly around um you know when you have quite a number of influences coming in about a something changing or a new piece of work that might be from a policy perspective a strategy perspective leadership um some bigger technology change being driven whatever those things are um and typically you might then have some sort of delivery teams trying to do work but they won't be able to get all of the answers they need the steering they need they will be caught up in inevitably a a cadence of meetings or decision making and so on i think the impact of not having someone who can meet and understand the relationships that are going on and corral all of the different influences into something tangible, clear, so that teams can continue their work. I think that is one definite gap and something that that sort of service leadership role can fulfill. So really getting to know everybody else, being the person who not necessarily makes all the decisions or has accountability for everything, because that's not realistic in a large organisation, but who knows the individuals involved, can get people together in a room, can at the start of a piece of work saying, if you, are, if you three are in conflict, we will slow down, we will waste money. What can we do? What can we set up now anticipating that in advance? Is one of you more important than another? Do I have the answer to say in the absolute, you know, when you're in conflict? I can play the role of negotiator and actually facilitate an agreement that's good enough. Like, how do we want to play this? What's right for our organisation? So that's one clear role. The other things around, you know, communicating uh, across the service outwards about the work's going on, making it visible, being that sort of more figurehead of all the work that's involved. Um, And then moving towards being able to set a vision and clear and steer work. Sometimes you're in a position, particularly where there's sort of a newer service where you can do that from the start. Sometimes because it's overlapping, it's being driven by elsewhere, that that takes time to put in. But ideally moving towards that, right, you know, pick, picking either, you know, the biggest service or or end to end or whatever makes sense. that's meaningful, where there's skin in the game, it's cost money to, to operate it and then sort of starting to move into that role. But just immediately there are there are things people can usefully do without anyone else understanding the concept of services or so on, I would think. So yeah, really, really good, very relevant point in many organisations right now. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, Jeff is on the call and I'm sure he's very grateful for that insight. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Don't know if there are questions in chat. Questions in the chat. Yeah. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, there's one question by Tanvi Jain. Uh, she says, hey, thank you for your fantastic presentation. I have a follow up to Martin's question. Once the leadership has agreed to work with services, how does the team involve the users and co-create services at this large scale? Is this part of the process? And if yes, how do you really get the users and other stakeholders to cooperate and participate in a productive manner? Mm. There's quite a lot to that question. Um, I think the first part is I'd sort of go back to, well, you're probably not going to suddenly tackle and change all of your services at once just because you've sort of got a clear idea about kind of what they are. It's a really handy way to sort of set up all your services to just sort of see the remit and the scope of what the organisation does in a different light. It doesn't necessarily follow that you then try and tackle all of them at once and do things differently. 
there's probably already investment in a large organisations anyway, like or other change happening in a smaller number of them, or that's not related to services, but that does affect them anyway. So working with something that's already starting and figuring out ways to involve users, involve humans, involve the people impacted is a really helpful um, starting point, I think. Um, in terms of thinking about uh, co-creation, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it doesn't remove the need for difficult trade-offs to be made and decision making and vision setting and being clear about what the job of a service is. So I think as you want to involve more people with a vested interest in how the service works because they have the experience of dealing with the sort of impact of it, it's not the only thing that you need to direct work across a service. So I think there's sort of a, a two way thing and you can't ask a sort of one person, no one person can make the overall trade off for everything. But it is unlikely that you can come up with a service that works for people, all of the different people involved, even if you're trying to co-create it. So it doesn't remove the need for some difficult decisions to be made at some point. So all that to say is um, focusing on some areas because there's already change happening. It makes more sense setting up ways of getting much 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 closer to people involving the people impacted is great you will still need i think a framework around what that service is doing calling out the trade-offs being really clear and honest about yeah we'd love to do that and we can't right now and one of the downsides is going to be this there is no clear answer for some of the situations but having a better communication and a story about why that is and what's going on is probably an important part of bringing services more closer to being sort of more human about services, if you like. Doesn't mean you sort of magically make everything work really well, is what I would say. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful or not. Thanks. I hope that answered your question, Tanvi. Anyone else? If not, I have a bit of a question because I, I know um maybe this is quite detailed, but I have friends who both kind of procure services and work on the kind of going for 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 the actual tenders. And it's that understanding what you actually want and need. Because some people might be then like experts in, in procurement, but they're not expert in this service that they're trying to procure. And I think this is particularly to kind of IT services and and kind of IT systems, but also kind of environmental issues. Like, how do you know, how do we know what it is that we need as an organization? Like what, like that kind of diagnostics aspect. So, okay, we, we've decided that we want to make it more kind of service, service led or service focused, structured, but how do you know how, how to do that in the most effective way? Like, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. And even taking like a, yeah, a single, piece of work it's 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 quite tricky I think I think it's sort of neither one thing or another so I think you know one way of doing things is to decide everything up front as long as you get you know smart people in one room together the idea that they will be able to work out what's needed even if you know they've, they've got experience so that's one way of thinking things the other is like the other extreme is like we cannot know anything at all we have to ask our staff or our people all of the questions they will tell us what they need, but they're not very good at answering them what's really needed. So it's not a very good way of doing it anyway. Another way, sort of somewhere in the middle, is sort of prototyping different ways, working some stuff out. I think the reality is you probably can know some or work out some of what's needed in advance um, and predetermine things from of certain categories. Like, for example, uh, if you're thinking about, you know, what pricing or what tax level or what this or what that, there might be some modelling you can do. There might be some, actually, we know these are risks with this particular thing that we're considering. We don't need to work it out. Well, we know that these are things already. And then the trick and the art and the craft and the experience comes with knowing what are the less certain things, which definitely include kind of actual human behaviour in real life situations. And then there are others as well, particularly with like newer technologies where like nobody knows the answer or the impact and so on. And in that case, leaving purposeful gaps 
in specifications or anything else that's being used as documentation to initiate something. And if somebody says, well, you know, I haven't got the answer to this, or how am I supposed to know this? Like, you know, if they're reviewing a sort of business case or a fund, then having the sort of grown up conversation about we are deliberately leaving gaps on purpose because that's the most sensible way of approaching this. Um, we are leaving space because we can only know the answers to these, these, these things by engaging more of a team, by doing some experimentation, by learning. We don't need to do that for everything. We are much more certain about that we need this, this and this. So I think it's a combined approach which kind of gets rid of the, oh, that's not agile or that's waterfall or that's this or that's that. Like the reality is, yes, yeah, some things can be known, some things can't be known. It takes, it's not not always very easy to figure out, figure out which, which of those there are and you can get, get it wrong. But that's sort of a more honest approach, I think, than the other extremes. I don't know if that's helpful without knowing more about the context, but as like a general principle, that's sort of, yeah, where I've come to, I think, with, with this. Yeah, I, th I think sometimes it's just helpful for someone to tell you that it's okay to not know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to, you know, I, I know people having conversations with uh, ministers where, you know, I in, maybe in an ideal world, everything would be very certain. You can come back and say, yes, we've done exactly what you wanted on time. It's all good. But the sort of the the worst thing is pretending that you can or thinking that you can and finding out that you can't and it's now really late. So I think preempting that is a much safer, more realistic way of operating by calling out what can't be known and feeling very confident about how right you are in saying that you can't know that yet because it's unsafe to pretend to know it. So it's, yeah, rather than you don't know it because you're not very good or like you should know it, we should be able to know it. It's like, that's not realistic then, is it? No, it makes makes sense. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any closing words? Um, seeing it's uh, four minutes to um, four minutes to one. Um, I don't think so. But like, how uh, brilliant, brilliant questions. I think there's more things in chat that probably haven't seen. Um, I'm on the internet, so feel free to kind of drop questions, say things, reach out. Um, I'm hoping to um, have some short workshops and things to kind of help people figure out the problems in the context of um, their organization. So um, there's a website, um, theserviceorg.com, where that will all go um, in the next month or so. Um, but it's been a real pleasure to meet you. And yeah, it's not easy, is it? But I think it's so, it feels so important that like this is like the next area that we look at because, and where organizations are kind of coming to with willingness about there are other ways of doing things, aren't they? We don't necessarily know what the answers are, but it's, yeah, really fascinating space to be working in at the moment. So, yeah, thank you. Really lovely yeah, to th meet you. Thank, thank you, Kate. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, really good questions. Um, we have a next event on the 13th of July on empowering young people through school citizen assemblies, which at least I look very much forward to. So I really hope to see you there. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for attending today. I'd love to see so many people. And thank you, Kate. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.